So this morning, you know, so I think some of you know that uh, I like to go hunting, or as, as Kelly says, uh, I like to try to go hunting. Um, I didn't have any luck this past uh, deer season. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have any luck the past turkey season. Hey, but there's always next year, right? That's what we always say. <laughs> but I did have a successful uh, fishing trip on Lake Ontario this past summer, so that was that was a lot of fun. Got some uh, good salmon there. And uh, this past, not this past weekend, but the weekend before, I actually had the chance and opportunity for the first time to do a pheasant and a chucker hunt. And a chucker is a is a small bird, like a kind of like a, a like a quail, um, something similar to that. And that was at a place in uh, Darien, uh, New York, a place called Ringnecks. On Broadway, and with Kelly's uh, number of people in Kelly's family, and we we enjoyed. It. We had a lot of fun, and of course, we had some tasty food uh, afterwards. It was quite tasty. That's, that's good. But this, uh, these pheasants and these chuckers and some other birds along those lines are a type of bird called upland bird, and it's kind of hunting upland bird hunting. Uh, and actually, there aren't a lot of these types of birds, uh, pheasants. Uh, specifically that are really truly wild and native uh, to New York State. So a lot of times the state, the DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation uh, for New York, will actually work with uh, farmers to, to raise these birds, to raise these pheasants, and then to either release them on state lands or these uh, pheasant hunts will be done on a hunting preserve. Uh, so don't worry, there's a, there's a point to, to this. But part of, part of uh, hunting these upland birds is also hunting with a dog. Uh, and these dogs, what they do is they'll point, they'll, they'll sniff out the bird, they'll find the bird, and they'll go up to the bird, and then they'll just point their nose right at it and just wait for you. And then there's another dog that, that may come along uh, and flush that bird out, actually chase that bird out there so it flies. And then you can uh, shoot the bird. I'm, I'm sorry if anybody sympathizes with PETA here. Um, and then, of course, we'll eat the bird. Um, but I want to share that because I found this. I found this joke uh, this morning, or, or as I was preparing for this message. So a man read an ad in the newspaper: hunting dog for sale, two thousand five hundred dollars, but well worth it. So the man called. The number and the man told him that he had to see the dog in action. The next morning they met and went hunting early. The dog flushed two birds from a clump of bushes, and when they fell into the water, the dog walked on top of the water, grabbed the birds, and walked back on top of the water. The man was amazed and bought the dog on the spot. The next day, he persuaded his brother to go hunting with him. They flushed a couple of birds, and the dog again walked on top of the water, retrieved the birds, and walked back to their boat on top of the water. He asked his brother what he thought of the dog, and the brother replied, So, you bought a dog who can't swim. <laughs> I mean, this dog was clearly blessed by Jesus, right? <laughs> this dog had the power of the Holy Spirit within him. I'll take, I'll take that hunting dog for two thousand five hundred dollars, no problem. But what this, what this, you know, joke illustrates is that different people have different perspectives on things, right? Here's a man you know, who saw who had the one perspective: a dog that walks on water, and then the brother had a different perspective: oh, it's a dog who can't swim. You know, so it illustrates those that, that different perspective that people have. And the reality is a lot of people have different perspective on things in life. So one example that we're, I think we're all pretty familiar with is one person will say the glass is half full, right? And another person will say, oh, no, it's half empty. You know, it kind of illustrates that point between an optimist and a pessimist, right? So another example might be something incredible, absolutely amazing, 
might happen. You might even, you know, think of it as a miracle, or it could be a real miracle. And it could bring this person this incredible sense of awe or this incredible sense of joy. And then you tell someone else, and they don't think it's that big of a deal. They're like, oh, so. No, and again, it kind of illustrates people have different perspectives on things that happen. Another example, maybe this in, incredible, just the, the world that we live in, the miracle of the world and of life that we have. Uh, if you look at the story in Genesis, God's breathing life into this world. God's breathing life into humanity, right, into, into people. And, this, and it tells the story of these incredible events that just fill us with the awe, with awe of God, with the power of God that shows his just incredible loving nature, right? This creator who's willing to create and share that love and show that love with this creation and then with people and to give people responsibility and to give people the ability to also be creative and to learn and so forth and be stewards and be a part of that creation. You know, it's, it's this incredible, amazing thing that has happened, right? It's the reason why we are all here. And then, some, and then you, you share this with someone else, and they might say, oh, well, science. It's just how it is. I mean, and, and they're not wrong. And they're absolutely not wrong. Science can definitely explain the how of things, but it doesn't always explain the why of things. You know, and, they, and they'll go into this long scientific uh, explanation with a lot of jargon words. And then say, oh man, you just, you just took the joy all out of it. You know, sometimes uh, people refer to those kinds of people as maybe like a, a joy killer, right? I don't know if you've ever heard that, that word before, you might have. Um, not to knock a lot of the seminary classmates I've had, but. A lot of people I met in seminary were kind of like that. But there were a lot of good people in seminary, too. Uh, you know, you'd be sharing this exciting thing, and they'd be like, oh, well, the doctrine of this says this, and the doctrine of that, and you're like, come on, man. But there are times when it's okay to have different perspectives. There's nothing wrong with that. People have different perspectives. Everybody's different, just how, how people are. And there is a season for everything. There is a season for those different perspectives as well. I think you know, the author of Ecclesiastes right, has some wisdom to say about that and to give about that. So this past Friday, we celebrated Christmas. and Advent, we were preparing and leading up to, to Christmas. And now we're in the season of Christmas. We're in the third day of the season of Christmas in the church. And it's a significant and it's a joyous event, right? The birth of a Savior, the birth of a Messiah, God himself, God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us. And from our perspective as, as believers, as Christians, this is an incredible, absolutely amazing event that God would show his love by being willing to be born as a baby. But from someone else's perspective, it may not be that big of a deal to them. This may just be the holiday season. This may just be just a special time of the year to, to celebrate the, the changing of the season into winter. Or it might just be an exciting time to watch movies like Frozen or Hallmark movies. You know, a lot of people like Hallmark movies, that's okay. Um, or it's the time to listen to, to Christmas songs, familiar Christmas songs on the radio. You know, people may not even be a, a believer in Jesus Christ, or they may just be at that kind of cultural uh, believer level, like a cultural Christian or a cultural Catholic, and they just may enjoy that holiday season, right? It's kind of like people who sing uh, Christmas carols or even hymns, Christmas hymns that come on the radio this time of year, and they don't always, and they don't realize the significance of the words that they're, they're singing. They're, they are proclaiming Jesus, and they may not even realize it, and it might be nothing to them. They may even know about the birth of the baby Jesus, but that might be it. That might be the extent of their knowledge of Christ, the extent of their knowledge of Jesus. It may even be the extent of their worship throughout the year, right? 
And, it, and that might be it. That might be their, their kind of siloed view of Jesus as just this baby born in a manger. And for some reason, every year, we just seem to, to celebrate. Again, so we have, we know that there are a lot of different perspectives on what Christmas is. From the believer's perspective, to the cultural Christian's perspective, to someone who might be an atheist, but a, a friendly atheist. And to someone who might be kind of a, a militant atheist, right? So I want to ask us this morning, what is our perspective on Jesus? What is our perspective on the baby, on the infant Jesus? I want to read the scripture this morning in Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. And this scripture will show the perspective of two different people on baby Jesus, on the infant Jesus. And those two people are Simeon and Anna. So I'm going to read Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, Every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit rested it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, you are now dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said this to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and praying night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon him. Wow, an incredible, amazing story that really shows a, a, an episode of the young, very young infant Jesus and these two prophets that had just incredible perspective on the baby that they were looking at. So to give some context for this passage, after childbirth, after Mary gave birth to Jesus, what was required under the Old Testament law was this ritual cleaning, and again that was required according to Hebrew law, and you can find that uh, in Leviticus. And uh, at this time, they're still under that Old Testament law, because Jesus had yet to fulfill that covenant. He was, you know, being here, he was starting to fulfill that, but he had yet to fulfill that covenant in his, in his full life, in his death, in his resurrection, in his ascension. So what this law required was that 40 days after Jesus' birth, they had to travel to Jerusalem to the temple. So it also gives us an idea about the age of Jesus at this time. But Jesus was about one and a half months uh, old at this time. So still a very small 
infant. And what the law required specifically for this ritual cleansing was for Mary to come to Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice. Now, the first sacrifice that was required would be a lamb as a burnt offering, and then also a turtle dove or a pigeon as a sin offering. And again, this is in Leviticus chapter 5 or chapter 12, if you want to uh, look that up on your own. But we read that they gave two uh, turtle doves or two pigeons. But to give even, even more context, the, the Levitical law, what it allowed for was if the family could not afford a lamb as a burnt offering, they could actually offer two doves or two pigeons. So what this tells us is about the, you know, about the, the status of Mary and Joseph, that they weren't wealthy. They weren't wealthy people uh, at all. And even when we are without and we do not have as much as our neighbors. What this also tells us is that God fully identifies with us, that God fully loves us. It doesn't matter what we have or what we don't have. Jesus himself, God incarnate, was born and raised in a family that didn't have much. Jesus has experienced so much of what so many of us experience. Jesus can fully relate. Now, in coming to Jerusalem as well and going to the temple, they also fulfilled part of the law as well to present the firstborn of their child, the firstborn of the family, to be in service to God. And again, this is part of the Old Testament covenant. And this had to do with during the Passover in Egypt due to the firstborn of the Hebrews being spared. As exchange, the firstborn of the Hebrew children would actually be dedicated to God. Now when they're at the temple and, they, and they're offering these sacrifices, what happens is they meet two people, right? And we've met them, Simeon and Anna. And these two individuals, these two, two prophets, they had a true perspective on this baby Jesus. They they, they fully knew who they were looking at, who they were holding. Can you imagine being there, Simeon, holding God incarnate in your arms, even just for a moment, and the peace that he has had. He's waited his entire life for this moment, and now he has peace. He, can, he even says he may even die in peace now because that he has met the Messiah. Simeon lived in Jerusalem, he was righteous and devout, as the scripture tells us, that he truly sought after God. Just he truly sought after what God wanted in life. And he also looked forward to the scripture says the consolation of Israel. He longed, right? He looked forward. He hoped. He waited for the Messiah, just waiting and waiting and waiting. And that word, the consolation of Israel, right? That truly shares, you know, another title of who Jesus is. The word is also translated as encouragement or comfort, the exhortation or the proclamation. Right? We have the encouragement of Israel. We have the comfort of Israel. We have the proclamation of Israel. This is who Jesus is, even as a one and a half month old infant. Imagine being there, looking at this infant, Seeing this infant through Simeon's eyes, who waited for so long, and knowing this would be the Messiah, who would be there for God's people, for Israel, and then for the entire world, a light for the Gentiles. Now, the scripture also tells us about Simeon that the Holy Spirit was with him. Now, this is a big deal for this time period. That God was truly with this man as the Holy Spirit, as the third person of God. And he had revealed this to him. He had revealed this truth that it would be this baby Jesus dedicated at the temple who would be this Messiah that Israel was longing for. The Holy Spirit was not given yet to everyone at that time. So this was a big deal. And it also shows us and should challenge us that we cannot and should not take for granted the Holy Spirit given to each one of us. As if you read the Old Testament, it was very uncommon for the Holy Spirit to be filled in the way that 
that the Holy Spirit has been given to each one of us today. But listen also to what Simeon proclaims. You know, just kind of maybe even imagine in your mind's eye that you are there at this temple at this time. Maybe it's a busy, a busy time period. There are people walking by. But you're there, you witness this event, and you're watching this. Or imagine what Mary and Joseph might have been thinking. You know, you, if you're Mary and Joseph, you already know. Who, you already have an idea just of who Jesus is. What they already know from what the angel has told them. And then what Simeon and Anna's words confirm, these prophetic words. Right? Let me just reread some of these. What does Simeon say? He says, you are dismissing your servant in peace according to my According to your words, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Just incredible words, incredible prophetic words being said about this baby, Jesus. And Simeon, again, he has peace. He's seen the Savior. He's seen the Messiah. As we look at our own lives this Christmas season, as we look at our own hearts this Christmas season, does the birth of Jesus give us that peace? Give us that sense of deep, divine peace that everything will be okay no matter what? Because we have Jesus. Does the birth of Jesus Christ, just looking at this baby infant Jesus, does it give you that sense of comfort? Does it give you that sense of contentment? That sense of that with everything that we've gone through, that, that you know that everything will work out with God's will because we have a Messiah who has come among us, God with us. And we can find peace and we can find comfort and we can find contentment in that. Now that we know that the Messiah has arrived. We know the salvation that is in our hearts. We know the healing that comes in our hearts, even through looking at this infant Jesus Christ, this healing that we have from the world's fears and anxieties. Imagine the, the fears and anxieties that was going through with the people of Israel at that time, that Jesus would be that comfort for them. That no, and for us today, that no, matter, no matter what happens with everything going on with COVID or things going on with the economy or things going on with politics or government, good or bad, we can have peace and we can have comfort because of the arrival of Jesus. We know that Jesus represents salvation for all, not just for Israel, but salvation for even the Gentiles. And we especially should be praising God for that because we are those Gentiles. We know that Jesus even as this infant is a light for the entire world and hope for the entire world. We know that Jesus represents glory to Israel. He represents glory for God's people. And for us, with the benefit of, of knowing how the story ends, with the benefit of being able to read and study scripture, and to have almost 2,000 years of, of of scriptural scholarship and church studies that we can look at, we know the significance of the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ, and we know what that means. We know the significance of that. As we continue to read in this passage, Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, they are filled with joy. They're amazed at what Simeon says. Now, if you're there, how would you feel in that moment as well? But then there's also a prophetic word that Simeon gives about what this salvation would cost, what this consolation of Israel would cost. Because of Jesus, many in Israel would fall. We think about those in power in Israel at the time of Jesus. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, those in the Sanhedrin, 
Think about all those religious leaders, all those government leaders. Because this Jesus, they would fall because this Jesus who was born into Mary and Joseph's family, Mary and Joseph's family who couldn't even afford a lamb. But this Jesus who would fulfill God's law and show those who are in power what God's law was truly about. And as Simeon talks about the many who would rise, we think about people like the disciples, right? These, these fishermen, these taxpayers, people who were looked down upon, the downcast, the sick, the poor, the humble. We know even that those who are even possessed by demons, Jesus would restore them to true life because of his love and because of his power and because of his authority for them and because of his inviting them into God's kingdom to experience God's love. And as Simeon says, we also know that he would be opposed and plotted against. Again, we think about the Sanhedrin, right? We think about the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. We think about those who stood in opposition to Jesus as you read the Gospels, who would reveal their true motives in leading Israel. That they would rather hold on to power and hold on to the letter of the law rather than fulfilling the spirit of the law that Jesus was actually fulfilling in his life and in his work. And we know that Jesus was ultimately killed. We know the difficult circumstances and his death on a Roman cross. The sword that would pierce Mary's soul as well. Simeon truly had perspective on this baby's, on this baby Jesus. Simeon knew exactly who Jesus was. I pray that this Christmas season, I pray that this challenges also our perspective on what Christmas is about, on what Chris, on who we celebrate during this season. This Christmas season, we acknowledge and we recognize and we know and we give praise to the Savior, the consolation, the comfort, the encouragement of Israel. Even when you see all the manger scenes and you see this infant Jesus lying in a manger, I encourage you to look at this infant more than just a baby, or look at this infant as the consolation of Israel, the Savior the arriving Messiah. We know that this baby, this infant Jesus, is God's fulfilling, God's fulfilling of the covenant he has made with Israel, that God is faithful to Israel, that God keeps his promises to Israel. And that should also bring us hope and comfort in knowing God's character, knowing who God is, that he is true to what he says, that Jesus is true to us, that as God is faithful, God will also be faithful to his promises to you. And again, we read those promises in scripture, those promises to his people. When you look at the baby, at the infant Jesus, what is your perspective on? During our, our Christmas Eve service, if you had a chance to be here or to watch, I said, I said this, that this Celebration is more than just about a myth or a legend or a feel-good story. This is about a truth and a, a powerful truth that will impact and pierce and change our own hearts and our own souls for the rest of our lives. And it will also change the entire world. But I would say this too. If it cost Jesus what these words that Simon spoke about, if this is what it cost Jesus, as we also follow after Jesus, even as we follow after this baby, infant Jesus who Simeon and Anna looked at, we must also be willing and we must also be ready to ex expect the same cost in our own lives. 
Now, there, there's only a paragraph devoted to the prophetess Anna, but we get a similar sense that is very similar along the lines of what Simeon had talked about. Though Luke doesn't record exactly what she had said, she, like Simeon, is someone who sought after God, who truly gave her whole life and her whole heart to God, who, who sought to devote her entire life to him. She was always worshiping. She was always praying at the temple, and she, too, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she was a prophetess. And she was at least 84 years old when she encountered this infant, this one-and-a-half-month-old infant baby, Jesus. And as Luke records, she gave words about Jesus regarding the redemption of Israel. She knew, just like Simeon, exactly who this baby Jesus was. So what are these words? What are this story that Luke records? What is this, this small episode in the life of the infant Jesus? What does it have to do with us? Well, first, it should shape our perspective on just who Jesus is. And the application is for us to examine and to reflect on our own thoughts and our own hearts and our own attitudes and our own perspective on the baby Jesus, on what Christmas is about. I encourage each, of us, each one of us this Christmas season, this next week that we have in the Christmas season, to take time to do that. Now, as I preached about and said so many times before, right, I said, read, pray, and listen. Right, so here's a scripture passage that you can read this week. I encourage you to reread read this scripture passage this week, Luke 2, 22 to 40. Pray about it. Think about the words that Simeon and Anna have said. And then listen to what God, listen to what the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who was in Simeon and Anna, and the same Holy Spirit we have by the work and the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that Jesus has also given us that same Holy Spirit. We can listen to that Holy Spirit as we read and pray about the scripture. Another application Put yourself in the minds, in the mindset of Simeon and Anna. Imagine what they're considering. Imagine the people of Israel who are awaiting a Messiah. And then you're there. You, know, you may not be the first person to meet this Jesus. That was reserved for the shepherds, right? But you're there. You get to meet this one-and-a-half-month-old infant Jesus. And you know what this Jesus represents, this Messiah, the Savior, the consolation of Israel. What are some of your emotions, some of your thoughts, some of your reactions? It should give us a sense of joy, a sense of peace. Right? Simeon finally had the peace that he was waiting his entire life for. Or maybe you're there, you know, you're in the crowd, you're in the people around uh, as Simeon is holding the infant Jesus, or as Anna is there speaking over the infant Jesus. And you witness this, and you hear this. What are you thinking? What's your reaction? This story, I pray, really shapes our perspective when we even, when we view, or just even think about the baby and the infant Jesus. That this is way more than a story about a cute Baby, right, being brought to the temple or being brought to the church. This is the baby and the infant Jesus who grew up to be the Jesus Christ that we know in the Gospels, who lived a perfect and a sinless life of love, who as a result of his life, as is fulfilling God's call on his life, as his fulfilling of the Old Testament law and the prophets and the writings, that the people in power were challenged, that the people in power were convicted, that they didn't react with humility, but they sought instead to go after Jesus Christ. What's our reaction to Jesus Christ? And we know that this, this Jesus, this baby Jesus, who would grow up to be the Jesus of the Gospels, fully human and fully God, even as that infant that Simeon was holding, 
Can you imagine being that Simeon holding God within your hands as a baby? That this Jesus would grow up to, to go die on a cross for us, out of love for us, to be crucified, and then who was resurrected on the third day, conquering death, conquering sin's consequences, knowing that we can have that same power given to us by Jesus and by the Holy Spirit to have God within our lives. We know that this infant Jesus is also Jesus who is king. That Simeon was holding a king in his arms, a divine king of the universe. Jesus who has true authority over all governments and over all entities, over all principalities and all creatures, of all the world, fully God and human, fully God and fully human, this is who the infant Jesus is. Yes, babies are cute. But I pray and I challenge you that this is not our only perspective when we consider the Christmas story, when we think about the birth of Jesus and what we celebrate during the Christmas season. But I pray that we consider from our perspective. And I, I pray that God challenges our perspective. And I pray that God challenges the perspective of even people who may be cultural Christians or even atheistic. That this is the birth of God incarnate. We go through a lot in life which causes us to have different perspectives on things. You know, earlier I had mentioned the Wisdom that is found in Ecclesiastes, right? Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 2 through 8. They describe a lot of the circumstances and a lot of the emotions and a lot of the things that we go through in life. And the author in that passage is not necessarily saying that it's right or that it's wrong, but he's just saying this is what happens and that there's a time and a season for this stuff. A time and a season to go through these emotions. And we can we know and we can relate to that. For example, some of the things that he talks about, a time to be born, a time to die. There's a time to plant, a time to pluck up what he's planting. He talks about a time for healing. There's a time also to break down and to, and to build things up. There's a time to laugh and a time to weep. There's a time to mourn and a time to dance. There's a time to embrace. And there is a time to refrain from embracing it. I think we feel that right now in COVID. There's a time to seek and a time to lose. There's a time to keep, a time to throw away. There's a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate. Sometimes we have that emotion and we seek God's forgiveness in that. But sometimes we just have that emotion. There is a time for war and a time for peace. The author of Ecclesiastes knows that we go through a lot of things in our life. And these things cause us to have different perspectives on things in life. That our one perspective may be joy and another perspective may be, man, no big deal. But regardless of whatever situation that we're in, all these situations that the author of Ecclesiastes wrote about, I pray that our perspective on who Jesus is doesn't change. That we know that this infant Jesus is the true king, is the true God of the universe. I pray that this season that we remember the perspective that Simeon and Anna had as they looked at this infant, as they held the incarnate God of the universe in their arms, one and a half month old Jesus. I pray that we allow their perspective on the baby Jesus to challenge our own hearts and our own understanding on what we consider when we look and think about this infant Jesus. Let's pray. Father, again, I thank you for today. Holy Spirit, I thank you for today. Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for who you are. And we thank you for your incredible love in coming to this world as God incarnate, being born 
as a baby to a family who could not even afford a lamb to give sacrifice. You truly love us. We praise you for that. And you know exactly what we go through. Jesus, I pray that as we consider your life, your entire life, even as an infant, that we will recognize you as our true king. That we will be humble before you and that we will be humble before even an infant. And that we will even praise and recognize that infant as our king. Jesus, Holy Spirit, I pray that you have spoken to each one of our hearts in a way that only you can. I pray that you watch over us and that you bless us and that you be with us this week and throughout the remainder of this Christmas season and that you fill us with your love so that we can love others in the way that you love us. Jesus, I pray this in your holy, your powerful, and your loving name. Amen. Thank you all.